Have you ever worked someplace where people spent more time talking about the drama at work than the work at work? Well, uh, perhaps if you've thought about it, uh, Moses probably takes the cake in, ter work, in terms of working with difficult people who have drama going on all the time. And so one of the things that I think that Moses did in order to deal with the drama was that he championed his, uh, his people even at his own expense. Um, you know, there's a, a place in, uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 32 where I find is kind of the key verse for this, where after they've been on uh, the mountain at Mount Sinai and Moses comes down and they've been worshiping the golden calf, God wants to wipe them all out, just wants to kill them all and start all over with Moses. And Moses says, Lord, please forgive their sin, but if you will not, blot my name out of your book of life. And so uh, today what I want to talk to you about is this idea of championing your employees even at your own expense. And I'm going to talk to you from three references. One is, is, is the Old Testament looking at uh, the story of Moses there in uh, the wilderness with the children of Israel. A second is a book I've written called Think Like Jesus, Lead Like Moses. And the third is a case study that, uh, that I've put together for teaching uh, uh, management practices as an instructor here at the University of Phoenix. Uh, based on a place that I once worked at. You know, certainly it's true that Moses dealt with difficult people. Uh, but one of the things that I find that he did was that he consistently uh, dealt with them uh, in, a, in a way that he did not respond to them personally, emotionally, or out of anger. Now certainly he had to dis discipline people uh, so that he could then equip those valuable people that followed along with them so that they were better able to do the job. And perhaps uh, like uh, some of you when you've had uh, valued employees who basically made a mess of things. You've had to clean up the mess yourself, and but then you created new policies and operating procedures that defined correct behavior, maybe had a private conversation or two with people to make sure that they got back on track, but then kept moving forward even though for the public you never made a stir out in the public. I'd like to begin the story, if I may, in chapter 19 of Exodus. It's been about 50 years since Passover, since they uh, left uh, uh, Egypt and they had crossed the Red Sea and they have now come to Mount Sinai. It's early in the third month, about 50 days is the amount of time that they've been spending out there. And so um, uh, Moses goes up the mountain to, to talk to God and he leaves his brother-in-law Aaron in charge of the people along with a guy named Hur. But while Moses is up there, God says that um, the people are literally out of control. And so he comes back down the mountain, talks to Aaron, and um, says, what's going on here? And Aaron says, you know, it's not my fault. They made me do all of this. And so uh, it's at that point that God is extremely angry and basically says, step away. I am going to destroy them, and I will raise up a new nation after you, Moses, and we'll just go from there. Now in the Bible it says that God and Moses spoke and God changed his mind. But one of the things that I think that is going on there is that Moses in his personal history at one point in time had um, uh, an attitude of it was all about him. He was out for his own glory. He was out for what was best for him. And over the intervening years God has taught him that it's not about Moses but rather it's about the people. And in some ways I think this was a test of Moses' character. Was he truly ready to be the leader God had called him to be? And so would he have God's interests at heart, God's glory at, at heart, the best interests of the people at heart instead of his own? Now, he goes to, to God and he says, Kill me if you will not uh, forgive them. Blame me. But then he turns around and he says, um, You all have sinned and this is very egregious. And for the worst of the people, he has the Levites go through uh, the Israelites and they kill about 3,000 of the worst offenders, probably the ones that really stirred up the people to worship the golden, uh, the golden calf. And so after that, 
God begins a process to rebuild his people and to bring them back into fellowship with himself. And so uh, one of the things that God does is he creates various festival holidays. Things like uh, Passover, uh, first fruits and the Feast of Weeks. Now in the Christian calendar Passover would be that, uh, that week of Holy Week from, from the time of Palm Sunday to Good Friday. First fruits in the Christian calendar is Easter and the Feast of Weeks occurs 50 days after uh, Easter on what we call Pentecost. And in the New Testament, in Acts 2.41, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, you might remember that 3,000 souls are saved. At the, at the uh, Golden Calf at Mount Sinai, 3,000 die. But then God redeems, and in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit is given, 3,000 are saved. And so what Moses does is he sets up operating procedures. He's got the Ten Commandments. He writes the Law of God in the book of Leviticus. And he provides various means by which uh, uh, they can make sure that they follow God's laws. As an example, in uh, Exodus 12.48, there is a procedure so that those members of, of the community who are not Israelites, can become part of, of the Israelite nation. In, in, in Leviticus chapter 10, there are a, si a series of rules that the priests must follow when they are handling the various holy items. And in fact, two of Aaron's four sons die because they fail to follow those laws to the letter. Also, God establishes various uh, uh, offerings to restore fellowship for both sin and, and for guilt offerings, to restore fellowship and to atone for sin. And so in these ways, God shows Moses how to set standards for the, for the children of Israel. There's one that I find particularly of interest for our conversation today. It's Leviticus chapter 24 verse 22, in which it says, there will be one law for the stranger among you and the native. Now think about this. Moses takes this, one law for everybody, one set of ethical standards for everybody, and he guides and disciplines Aaron and the children of Israel as they learn how to live together in unity under one set of laws. These are statutes established by God to guide behavior. We do the same thing in business, don't we, when we have HR standards, when we have operating uh, procedures, and things of that nature. One of the things that I try to do when I talk to my students is about how the compensation plan that a company has to incentivize people can affect behavior, can either increase drama or minimize drama. Uh, there is one law for the executive and for the line employee when it comes to ethical behavior, not two standards. And so uh, um, one of the things that in, from my experience, years ago I worked for a telecommunications company and uh, a lot of times in, in a sales organization there are at least two sales channels. There's what's called the direct sales channel for people who are employed directly by the company who go out on a daily basis to sell the products and services of the company and there's what's called a partner channel or an alternate channel made up with companies who sell other stuff but um, they sell your products and services to complement their services. Well, in, in where I worked, uh, we sold network services, phone lines, high-speed internet, things of that nature. And I ran the alternate channel program for the company in the Indianapolis market. I was called the alternate channel manager, or ACM. And so um, uh, in, in our uh, company, the branch manager was compensated out of both buckets of money. Now, in that type of a system, when you've got two sales channels, you can have what is referred to as sales channel conflict. People competing for the sale from the same customer. The general manager, because he got paid out of both buckets of sales revenue, it was in his best interest to create a sense of team, to set up a, a, a series of policies and procedures that called for fair play in terms of who owned the sale, to make sure that the channel partners were taken care of, to make sure that the direct uh, sales people were taken care of, but most importantly, to make sure that the customer was taken care of and that their phone lines didn't go down when they were on the phone. And so that worked fine until one day the company changed the compensation plan. What had led to a series of cooperation and teamwork all of a sudden led to drama and conflict 
and um, backbiting and so forth. So as time went on, we had a new general manager and a new direct sales manager, and I was still there as the alternate channel manager. And there had been a sale that one of my channel partners had made to a law firm that subleased uh, space to tenants, and so all the phone lines were under the law firm, under my channel partner. Well, the sales guy on the direct side came in and uh, tried to finagle one of the sales so that he would get the commission. And the long and short of it was, was that the customer's phone lines went down. He lost uh, telecommunications services completely. And I had to scramble to follow up on the paperwork to make sure that we had a paper trail for everything that was done so that first of all we could restore service to the customer and second of all we could decide on who got the compensation. And so um, I use that story in a case study that I put together for one of the management classes that I teach to show my students how important it is to have a compensation plan that incentivizes our employees to provide teamwork and cooperation instead of uh, um, having people working against each other in factions and having a bunch of disunity. You know, if you look at Matthew chapter 11 verse 30, Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's think a moment about a yoke. When you put a yoke on the oxen, it's not that they're not going to do the work anymore. They still got to pull the load. They still got to do the load, uh, do the work. But now they're going to share that load, share that work evenly as the weight is distributed evenly across the team of oxen. And so what Jesus was doing was to seek to build a community of believers who were unified in belief and action. And isn't this one of the key pieces of uh, advice that Moses gets from his father-in-law Jethro in Exodus 18.34 where Jethro says to Moses, If you do this and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure all this drama and these people and you will go to their place in peace. And so uh, in conclusion, thinking about uh, what we need to do to win the loyalty of our employees, to win the uh, uh, business of our customers and the respect of our stakeholders and our vendors, uh, we need to do what Moses did, which is have the best interests of our people at heart. Moses demonstrates this characteristic when given the chance to become the new Abraham he says no. Moses established policies and procedures uh, designed to foster community, not competition. Our challenge then in a work environment is to create a corporate culture uh, where all of our stakeholders can be brought together as a team to cooperate so that we all go to our place in peace, that profits are made, we hire employees, their employees take care of their families, and all go to their place in peace. And so now what I'd like to suggest that you do is that in your small groups, spend some time with the, the workbook there in part two round table discussions and talk about the principles that we've been uh, discussing so far.